For the 2022 season, the Warriors need to focus on the only thing that truly matters, and that's winning a championship. The team finished out the 2021 season strongly with a 15-5 record showcasing that they figured out the formula for a team that has much less star power than that of the dynastic run of the prior years. The team managed to clinch the 8th seed but consequently dropped out after two losses in a row, one to the Lakers and another to the Grizzlies in the playing tournament elimination games. While it may seem like a sore ending to what could have been an incredible resurgence, we must not forget how limited the roster was at this point as well as why it was so limited to begin with. Let's just say it was a lot more than injuries. The Warriors, while remaining a top defensive team, still lacked the scoring punch to knock out opponents. There were games where they looked like they could beat any team in the league, and others where they looked like the team that went for 15 total wins in a season. Wait, that is the 15 win team without Steph Curry. Anyway, you get the point. Changes to the starting lineup as well as the bench encourage a lot of the progress that took place between the poor beginning of the season and the strong closeout to end the year. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at three players that helped put this team in win mode and three players that, well, thought they were on vacation in the bay. This and much more. Hey, what's happening everyone? This is Swish. If you've been watching the videos and enjoy the content, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of my video updates. As I said before, a number of players impacted this team winning much more so than others and while I won't cover every single issue of every single player, this video will highlight some of the more egregious abuses of a roster spot that still have yet to be rectified and should be this offseason. I'll begin with the three players that need to be traded or cut from the roster as they are absolutely not helping whatsoever. The first and most urgent is Alan Smalagic. Smalagic is a 20-year-old player from Belgrade, Serbia who was first stashed in the G League to play for the Santa Cruz Warriors three years ago. Since he was too young to play in the NBA, being 17, Kirk Lakob, who had scouted Smalagic back in Serbia, did not want any other team to have a chance to draft him, so he was hidden during exhibition games where other scouts would be present and when he became of age, the Warriors moved up in the draft trading two future second round picks to draft Smiley at 39. Just for perspective, here are a number of players drafted after Smiley in 2019. Eric Pascal, yes, the Warriors drafted Pascal after Smiley, Taylor Horton Tucker, Terrence Mann, Jalen McDaniels, and Kyle Guy. All are players that have contributed significantly more to their teams this year than Smiley. To add insult to injury, the Warriors then locked up a four-year contract with a second rounder to the tune of over $6 million. During his time with the Warriors, Smiley has averaged 3 points per game and 1.5 rebounds in just under 8 minutes. To make matters worse, these are garbage time minutes where he's had plenty of opportunity to showcase against the weaker opponents on the other team. He did this on 30% efficiency beyond the arc, on very low volume, and for a big man at 6'10", his 46% efficiency from inside is quite poor. On top of that, he's actually gotten worse in his second year. Needless to say, the Warriors cannot afford to keep Smiley on the roster. While the Warriors haven't gotten much from him, it's time to cut their losses and move on, free up a roster spot and get a player that can contribute. For the price they paid Smiley, they got Bazemore who was able to start for the team during that incredible stretch to end the season. The next player the Warriors have to part ways with is Jordan Bell. Drafted with the 38th pick in 2017, Bell is a 6'8 forward that struggled to fit in with the Warriors his first two years in the league. While Bell helped us during our championship runs, it's tough to say the way in which he contributed couldn't have been improved had the Warriors signed just about anybody else instead. Along with the Warriors, Bell has been on three additional NBA teams over the course of the last two years, including the Timberwolves, Grizzlies, and the Wizards. He failed to make an impact on any of these teams, which explains why he struggled so much with a team that has a winning culture. That is, he doesn't impact winning in any meaningful way. The truth of his signing with the team is that the Warriors planned on upgrading Juan Toscano Anderson's contract from being a two-way to a guaranteed contract and just wanted to take advantage of the open roster spot. It is very likely they are looking to move him anyway if the right player comes along, and with much younger talent coming along shortly that the Warriors can choose to develop, it may not be long before the team announces they're moving on. During his single game with the Warriors this season, he grabbed 5 rebounds, had 2 assists and made 1 of 2 free throws in 15 minutes of garbage time play. 
This could likely be a result of him being out of shape and having to shake off a bit of rust. However, this level of play does not scream NBA level talent. At this stage of his career, Bell should be much more productive against young third string players regardless of the opportunity he's given. He seemed a bit lazy on the floor and just too casual after making a mistake. He just didn't seem hungry enough to want what the Warriors are potentially offering him. That being said, I don't think he will make a very productive part of this team going forward. The third and final player that the Warriors absolutely need to move on from is Stefan K Ah, Michael Mulder, an absolutely devastating shooting phenomenon when the game isn't on the line. Mulder is like the bastard stepchild of the Splash Brothers. He will make it rain threes and he will posterize you if you're not careful. Unlike the other two guys I've listed here, Mulder is the only guy that can make you regret not investing in him if you're not paying attention. He is a 26 year old second year player that averaged just shy of 40% from three and gave us a little more than five points in 13 minutes off the bench. I don't think you guys understand what I'm seeing here. This man can go nuclear. The problem with Mulder is he just doesn't show up in games where we need him to be that knockdown three point shooter off the bench. His shooting is so tied to meaningless games and minutes it's absolutely predictulous. You would think I'm exaggerating, but in games where the win is decided by 10 or less points, with the exception of that meaningless exhibition versus the Pelicans at the end of the season, Mulder shot 35% from 3. In games where the Warriors win by a blowout, meaning by more than 10 points, or the games don't matter, including that meaningless exhibition versus the Pelicans at the end of the season, Mulder shot 45% from beyond the arc. That's an incredible 10 point difference of shooting between games that matter and games that don't. If your job on this team is to be a shooter and you're just below average when the team needs you most, chances are you're not providing much help. Being the namesake of Clay Thompson's father is by no means a string that needs to be attached to the malfeasance of continuing to grant Mulder a spot on the roster. He will continue to bamboozle the Warriors into thinking that he can make those shots. And he can. Just not when it matters. People lie, but numbers don't. This is part one of a two-part series. I'll follow up with the three veteran bench players that the Warriors need to hold on to for the next NBA season. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell. So Thank you guys for watching. Till next time. Swish.